So we start the afternoon uh, session with uh, a session on what's ailing the Indian bond markets. Uh, this is a very pertinent topic. So from looking at the global view, the macro view on the uh, country, we dive down into the actual markets from the uh, practitioners. It's uh, my honor to introduce uh, Jayen Shah, uh, CFA, who will be the moderator of the session. He will introduce the panelists. Jain Shah is the co-founder of uh, Mabuka Capital Advisors, which helps its client raise both equity and uh, debt funds. He has nearly 25 years of experience in the uh, market, worked at various firms including um, IDFC, HSBC, Standard Charter, RBS and uh, Kotak Mahindra among others. Um, he has uh, been instrumental in helping the firms he worked for win various awards. Uh, including at um, IDFC, the uh, winning the uh, Indian Bond Market House Award in uh, 2015 and um, Asia's uh, Best Local Currency uh, Bond Deal for uh, 2016. He is a CFA charter holder. He has a Master's in Finance and a degree in Engineering. Welcome, Jim. But before all, I would like to uh, wish our local uh, superhero, Mr. Rajni Gans, for his birthday. So from Civil Society, all of us, we probably reach out to him and say happy birthday, belated. At the end of the day, probably Meera, you may have a kick-cutting ceremony as well. Uh, on that uh, note, I have few superstars on my panel as well. And uh, let's, let me start by first uh, bringing on the dais Lakshmi. Lakshmi, may I request you to come uh, over? Lakshmi, of course, all of you know her well, but it's my duty to kind of retrace a bit of her uh, journey, almost two decades worth uh, as an asset manager a company called Kotak Mahindra. Must have started with when the AUS was having a few hundred million dollars equivalent to now, uh, no, few tens of billion dollar equivalent AUMs. So that's been the growth that she's seen. Uh, let me bring on stage uh, Mr. Sachin Pillai. Uh, Mr. Pillai, he heads up as CEO for Hinduja Leyland Finance Limited. He's been in this role for last seven odd years. Uh, though in his journey, he is he did start with Ashok Leyland Group in the finance vertical, moved on to City, thereafter HDFC Bank, and uh, last 2012 onwards, he's been back here. He's a he's a local superhero, Lakshmi. Travels from Mumbai, so you have a local superhero, uh, 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 oh no, Mumbai based superhero already on the dais. Uh, let me ask uh, Kartik. Kartik, may I ask you to come over? Kartik is the one who has been rating a lot of X deeds and misdeeds of many of the financial sector enterprises in the country. He heads up financial sector ratings at ICRA. At Ikra, he is, I think, has a 17, 18 year of his uh, journey there. And he has well SVP. He also, like me, spent time studying up again. We could not finish up our studies enough in management school, so we had to study again. He is also CFA charter holder. Uh, last but not least, Mr. Ra Dr. Rajan. May I welcome him back to the DAS? <laughs> Dr. Rajan's introduction was all up ahead with you in the morning. And uh, after the morning opening session that we had doing a macro, a global macro, the China, US, China, rest of the world. Interestingly, emerging market asset class, uh, specifically in the debt side or rate side, has been ranked as per him uh, as number two in the world for last year, so which is a very interesting revolution. We didn't know that our asset class were doing better outside than maybe inside. But thank you for that, Dr. Rajan, to let us know that uh, there is no, there is hope that we've done something good at this. Uh, let me trace back uh, some of the morning uh, comments that happened. Uh, very interesting, very, very uh, uh, apparent and lively in the, in the current context that they are the building block to what uh, the debt market is all about. So global macro, emerging markets to 
the tracing of India debt market since 1993-1994 onwards, thanks to Shriram and other panelists, Santosh. Then of course we had two uh, very good uh, participations, I mean two very good uh, insights being shared by Dr. Anand and Professor Anand. With that A square uh, performance so far, it's upon us, all of us to ensure that uh, we continue to provide with that momentum and tempo. Uh, switching tracks and actually tracing through 1995 onwards, this is where my journey in debt markets has begun and I continue to remain associated there. Uh, I would love to rename debt, uh, fixed income markets to the debt markets or credit markets. They are separate asset class for themselves and uh, may not necessarily need to be clubbed with each other in a uh, narrow focus way of looking at it because each of them has their own payoff profile uh, relative benchmark for this but have their own payoff profiles that we all uh, look forward to as an investor category, investor class. Over years, bond markets, while they have been uh, growing on the volume basis, but there have been many a uh, window where it actually had done a far better job than what we are doing today in the sense that type of innovative structures that were visible in late 90s and up to 2004-05 or up to 7, uh, we haven't, some of them have not come back to the industry, the uh, manufacturers have not been able to bring it back in that uh, gumption or that momentum. So there were times that uh, corporate bonds had the first ever strips done which was done before even the government introduced it for the uh, government bonds. ABS, MBS, they were done way back in 98, 99, 2000, 2001. It went off shelf, taxation rules came in, changed the characteristic of that part of the market curve. Or very recently, they've resurfaced and we'll get more of the, that in the conversation. And with that, I will uh, open the question uh, with some of the statistics that we have been seeing so in this uh, 18 months and 24 months and I would focus largely on the last 18 months of our journey in the debt markets and the credit markets which is fairly topical. We will all can narrate how many uh, minefield or uh, kept bursting on the path whether it was ILFS that started with or thereafter uh, something happened with uh, the, the housing finance sector, DFHL, Altico, uh, Jet Airways. So things have kind of gone fairly uh, interesting to another interesting incident or episode and they made the market participants nervous to no end. And in my recollection in the last so many years, this 15-16 months is the longest ever phase of uh, window where we continue to have uh, some amount of uh, nervousness, anxiety in the ecosystem uh, both reflected through the volumes that have dropped for the corporate bond asset class uh, specifically for the embassies and in today's session uh, we would probably spend some amount of time discussing uh, the issues that we have seen so far and way forward. Uh, with that, uh, uh, may I uh, hand over to Sachin to uh, kind of help us trace your action in the last 15 months, 16 months since the time ILF has uh, become a household world again. Thank you. And given that background and the fact that you know you got MMM, you know, my co panel members out here, starting off or taking off from the industry HFC prices and you know, putting me into the center, really a risk take for you, Ajay, and for that matter. And, uh, uh, but yeah, no, it, it's been challenging. It's all started off post ILFS and DHSL, which almost happened in succession. And uh, the entire NDFC segment, HFC segment, got affected by that. The immediate steps that we saw, the immediate reaction that we saw was that between October and Jan of last year, that is October 19 to Jan uh, 20, we saw a lot of readjustment happening as far as MBFC's liability profile is concerned. And that kind of led to a slowdown in terms of their disbursement. Largely led by the ALM mismatches that was there in the system and uh, short term got you know, replaced by long term, it took some time. But uh, here again, if you look at it, the retail NDFCs or NDFCs who had origination capabilities on the granular side, they were able to do it much faster as compared to NDFCs who were on wholesale side. And we did see you know, almost all the retail NDFCs coming back into business from February onwards. So it was to that extent uh, you know, a short little one. And uh, it was almost business like normal. Obviously the fact that 
most of the asset categories that they were presenting was something which the banks liked in terms of taking the over on a portfolio basis and therefore we saw a lot of sell on happenings. Bank were very comfortable doing that given the seasoning and the, you know, uh, the 90 turn and the halfway coming into play and therefore that's the preferred structure which um, you know, kind of emerged. And that kind of brought back equity into the, in, into the uh, business as far as uh, retail you know, NDFCs are concerned. Along the same time, we saw the window emerging for offshore borrowing coming in and uh, we saw a couple of issuances which happened on that side, large ones for that matter. And then the public NCD group was also something which many of the NBFCs export. So from, uh, say, I don't know, over the last three, four years where liquidity was never kind of a problem, the flow was, you know, uh, very much out there and therefore it was a given that liquidity would be there. Suddenly the NBFCs faced, up, you know, uh, after September uh, uh, kind of a phase where it was not there. The readjustment happened and then you know it was like once bitten twice shy, they all stopped upon cash with the overseas uh, window and the public can see this and so on and so forth. And that kind of you know resulted possibly you know, many of them sitting on cash at the cost of negative very, you know, uh, cash became kind of the theme as far as uh, NGFC liability is concerned. But the problem still possibly continues for the wholesale NGFC because the assets that they hold are not something which is kind of uh, uh, I mean, friendly or the banks don't look at it, those assets as a for refinance and therefore, you know, that problem still continues. We, of course, at uh, Hindu Jalil and Finance, the organization that I represent, we are more onto the retail side of it. We are uh, vehicle financiers, you know, uh, in the real sense, and therefore, uh, you know, for us, uh, it, uh, as we saw things happening, uh, while, you know, as I mentioned, three to four years or five years, you know, we never had a liquidity issue in the system, but for us, right from day one, this company got incorporated in 2008 and we got a, we started our business in 2010 after we got a license, and right from day one, couple of things that we put into place as far as our liability strategy is concerned is kind of helped us, and uh, it, one was to say that at any given point of time, we will always have three months of liquidity in terms of sanction and disburse lines for our future business, and if I have to relate with the data point as of 30th September 2019, we were sitting on sanction lines of close to 4,700 crores, which essentially meant that if we didn't get a single sanction also for us business is as usual till February, which was five months down the line. And in the history of our company, we never had a sanction which ever got withdrawn. Second was, as I said, the, the larger, I mean, plate out came in, in terms of, you know, the over-reliance of short-term by NBFCs and therefore, you know, most of them are holding 15 to 20 percent of their overall liabilities in the form of commercial paper. For us, it was only 6 percent. And another philosophy that we have put in place since 2013, because that's the time when we started accessing funds from capital markets, was to say that at any given point of time, our CP you now will be a tower of my drawing power of my working capital limits. So as of 30th September, total drawing power was 1,275 crores. CP was 925 crores. So therefore, 1, 2, 1,275 minus 925 is what we use for a CC. The balance was kept unutilized. And that, that kind of you know helped us big time because we didn't have any issues as far as short term. And of course, you know, CPs all got replaced also for us. And the third one, which is possibly a function of the business that we are in, in by design, which is to say that all our loans are monthly amortizing. So we get our installments every month, whereas all my repayments are quarterly, half yearly, how yearly, or good at as for the structure. So uh, just to give you one more data point, startup is financial year. Normal average collection, collection efficiencies being in place will collect around 10,000 crores, whereas my entire repayment and cost put together is only 6,000 crores. So therefore, on an ongoing basis, you know, my fresh sanctions come kind of help me for the disbursement, not for any repayment. So that's a model that we follow, which essentially means that on the ALM side, I'm positive on each every bucket. Even the there's a minus 15 available in the first bucket, but we are positive 43 percent on that. So these couple of things put together, we never had a single day of stoppage in disbursement or going slow on disbursement. Between October and Jan, we saw a lot of vehicle financing and asset financing companies going slow, which was the opportunity which was there in the market, which kind of helped us. Our target for the last year, as far as ADM was concerned, on a consolidated basis of 25,000 crores, we ended up at 26,400 crores because we had that window where and the other financiers were going slow and it came in at a better deal also. So the same philosophy continues for us as we speak right now. It's our CT is only 5% of my overall liabilities. We got almost four months of our, you know, next four months disbursement kind of, uh, you know, uh, pipeline in place in terms of sanction and drawn lines, and ELM remains the same. So uh, that's what I thought I'll share on this.
It's very heartening to hear from you, uh, Sachin, that uh, your bounce back was pretty quick. And uh, given the nature of the uh, activities that were going on, the nature of the SFLAS that you were uh, focusing on, uh, helped you tide over quicker, quickly, and maybe it was an opportunity in disguise for to add your ways to capture market share. In the I'll come back to you on some of those points later. This must have been times of opportunity, times of sleepless nights. Uh, how do you think many of the fund managers, including Santosh, who have reacted, reacted during that era of last uh, 15 months, and other fund managers, other peers, general overview of what did fund manager industry do? I slept well because I gave my money to Sachin, so I didn't have to worry about that. Uh, As a DCM hold, I can charge fees. Uh, the Seeker Society, we can share royalty on this point. So, uh, yeah, good afternoon everyone. Uh, firstly, uh, uh, thanks to the CFA Society to actually having uh, started every uh, session on time uh, and truly lived to the word IST, which is not Indian stretchable time. Uh, otherwise, we would have done more uh, revenue to the aviation sector because we would more often miss flights than actually uh, getting them on time. Um, see, the fund manager's job uh, usually is always a thankless job. You know why? Because uh, not, and I'll come to the credit prices in a bit, but uh, it's because uh, you do well, why you didn't do better? And if you did worse, why haven't you outperformed the index? So when you're doing better, you have to be better than the best. And when you get to the best, you only come down. It seems, sorry, Lashmi, it seems that uh, you are uh, in front of your uh, main top, Mr. Porter, uh, uh, responding to a performance appraisal. <laughs> Mr. Porter doesn't ask about performance because he's worried about top line and bottom line, which comes to him anyway. So, and then uh, capital market. Okay, so, sorry, many distributors are earlier then. Yeah, distributors, distributors are uh, uh, quite charitable to Kotak. So, uh, thank you all for that if you are listening to me. Uh, so, I think it is always this uh, catching up game which is happening from a fund management perspective. And uh, some of those uh, catching up game, you know, see, Rajin Khan is aging. But he's aging very gracefully. See, he has another release lined up next month for Pungal and it will be houseful. Doesn't matter if he's 60, 65 or 70. But imagine another actor who is not of that repute, who tries to do something, a repeat of Gaji, he or she was would, could literally flop it. And I think that is what um, clearly happened in the last uh, 12 to 14 months, or specifically uh, as a fallout of the ILFS uh, crisis from an industry standpoint, that uh, People or fund houses who could not copy well, who could not, uh, you know, be like uh, Rajdi, had actually had series of flops on box, box office. Whereas uh, people who could pull it off, even with movies like uh, Kala or uh, there is there was Beta, there's a lot of these Tamil movies. I'm sorry, I'm used to Bollywood examples. These are one of those few uh, Tamil movies that I watch under duress, so that's why I'm able to share some names. So. Those kind of people actually had to be happy with a slightly more suboptimal performance. And this was a phase, I would say, in the uh, financial services space, I would say, where the um, equity markets, you know, the pulse or the heartbeat or in typical Bollywood terms, the dharkan of the uh, equity markets were actually dependent on looking at the culture in the fixed income markets. I have never ever, bold and underlying, spoken to so many equity managers across the globe in the last 12 months. So every uh, foreign fixed income manager, no, sorry, foreign equity manager coming into India, there was one mandatory meeting saying that no, if there is no meeting, at least I want to do a 10 minute call. And trust me, we are in uh, December 2019, well more than 12 months into the anniversary of Ireland FS, there is still no sweet haga to actually stitch the bond market sentiments. We have some small sweet haga, some small stitches we have done, but nothing very material. And the reason for that, is twofold. One is that the expectation theory, you know, okay, if I'm getting something, I'm going to keep it. It's like making dosas on a, I don't cook also, by the way, but nevertheless, I eat. So I know that it's like cooking dosa on a stone versus cooking dosa on a mirla tawa, which is a Teflon coated. The expectation in this case was the second one, that the Teflon coating will never wear out. That credit risk fund will never default or credit will never default, so you are always in a fairy tale land. When that expectation got broken, and that expectation got broken when an entity like AAA actually defaulted. So you know, it's like, oh, Rajini movie, how can Rajini movie go house less, not house full? How can it be empty? It's no way possible. So that kind of an expectation crept in, 
and that is the reason people started disowning this category fun we heard it in the earlier panel in the morning that sentiment is gradually now giving way where people are saying that you know okay enough is enough how much can you keep going and you know going by uh, uh, critic score or popular opinion critic scores may be biased so let me go and form my own view the credit spreads are widened in my entire career in kotak in 20 years i have never seen such high spreads ever we heard in the previous panel with anand that uh, the term spread and i talk about term spreads and talk about government bond spreads is one of the highest in the world trust me even the corporate bond spreads between um, government bonds and triple a at least they have compressed but the government bonds and non triple a's are on the highest that we are seeing right now and beyond that point there is no uh, point of a 10 year corporate bond or a 10 year in we see for that matter absolutely and this is going to be retail world absolutely yeah. Because everybody want tick tack to go and hear the returns I go. So everybody want to invest, and within the it's like the uh, uh, Twitter and the WhatsApp effect. The moment you send the WhatsApp, you want to right swipe or left swipe and see who has seen it. I mean that desperation to make money in the market is is also leading to some mistakes likely to be made by money managers. We're all humans, right? I have name of God in me, but I'm still human. So I think uh, all of that sanity prevailing is now seeing the light of the day. series of back to back um, i would say flops given by uh, some of the superstars of uh, bollywoods and hollywoods and hollywoods which is in our case the triple a's uh, which are superheroes are actually leading to uh, uh, another set of superheroes coming which is uh, the expectation that if i put it into a credit risk fund it is like the mid cap in equities so let me be mentally prepared that if i want to sit for slightly longer period of time that has to be so i think that is one very positive fall out of that second there is should be told uh, investors and advisors have actually started differentiating the wheat from the chaff the curd rice and the risotto rice both look quite fresh right so they started differentiating that we uh, because one is south indian and one is continental so they realized that okay this looks similar in texture but there is a de deviation and i think that is the biggest revelation that can happen and the biggest uh, sigh of relief that money managers like us can have because we kept feeding people curd rice and people wanted risotto not knowing the fact that i am a south indian restaurant and if i am a south indian restaurant and if you come to me for with an expectation of risotto trust me i will mix curd i will not mix cheese in that and that realization having stepped in i think that is the reason chennai continental restaurants are having much more in demand so i think good realization good uh, as they say you need some jhatkas uh, to kind of shake you off your slumber uh, because uh, every kumbhakarna they don't have a vibration thanks on that one that note but just to extend a uh, few more uh, data points uh, which also kind of brought out in the previous panel that uh, epf for instance uh, has completely stopped any investments in anything which is called corporate bond market They anyway were not investing in something which was called uh, structured of offerings and associated, and now they've gone ahead and uh, done uh, even stop that situation. Again, uh, uh, throw the baby with the bath tub kind of a situation when uh, we don't understand or uh, don't uh, are able to not dissect the issues from the uh, general noise. Uh, moving on uh, to other investor classes, uh, I would love, and that's why Dr. Rajan uh, uh, coming across to you. the fpis point of view investors and uh, while you may help us understand how offshore investors uh, were uh, looking at india at that point in last 12 months and what were thoughts or what were discussion points that you may be uh, party to or maybe uh, you know to could help us see uh, see through the lens of uh, international investors looking at india in last 12 15 months can you can everybody hear me okay So um, I guess that you know uh, most of you know that foreign investors involvement in India comes first, and then uh, through FX, <coughs> and thirdly through the government curve, and only fourth and very distant last through private credit. So private credit denominated in rupees, domestic credit markets. Uh, the domestic credit markets are not sufficiently um, fully developed in India. For foreign investors to have substantial holdings, uh, they also don't have the infrastructure and the um, ability to do the due diligence and the deep credit work that would actually be required uh, to own this. So it was somewhat of a non-event from the standpoint of actual 
um, returns or for investors. I think that um, maybe one uh, help I can give you is uh, that I can uh, I can draw some analogies uh, to what other such situations have been in the past. Uh, we've had much, much larger blow-ups in practically every country, but to take a couple of uh, examples. Now, I can't match Lakshmi's metaphor, so I'll pull back on similes. Uh, so let's go to the US um, 2008 crisis, where a very large shadow banking system was exposed as the first example. What happened there was that uh, money market funds that are supposed to have essentially no credit risk had taken on structured loans that were supposedly short in duration, but in fact had huge embedded credit risk in them because the ratings were, were bad. And when that came to light, um, there was a huge wipeout. And following that, uh, regulators had to clamp down and essentially get rid of that entire shadow bank. Um, another example that uh, one can, can draw some lessons from is China. So uh, within the last uh, three years or so, China has taken some extraordinary steps to clamp down on um, its own shadow banking system. So there are a bunch of things called trusts that essentially were parallel vehicles to bank lending that sprang up. Some of those uh, operated through the internet and some of them operated as side offices of the bank. So if you went into the bank and uh, you needed to borrow, and regulators have been getting very um, strict with banks about the criteria that they use to lend. So um, what they would say is, I can't do this, but if you just go to this office next door, uh, there's a fellow there that can help you. And um, what would happen is that you go in there and uh, you could get the loan at an additional 2 or 3%. And that would then get uh, funneled and channeled through retail vehicles. So all this was being funded through, uh, you could you could invest online and uh, that would get you know funneled into, into this lending. And none of this was subject to the standard regulatory scrutiny. And this is key, that a bank lending book would be subjected to, not subjected to the statutory capital requirements, the liquidity requirements, uh, the credit, um, uh, and the credit was not scrutinized. So now in the first case, you saw a case of bad credit ratings. And in the second case, you saw regulatory arbitrage. Now, I think that these are the two yellow flags, if you will, uh, that are required. I think that shadow banking systems per se are not bad. But when they uh, when, you, when you get a, a situation where people lose uh, confidence uh, because of a particular incident, then the solution to that can be to re-channel the credit through um, non-conventional channels where uh, these elements are absent. You know, where the regulators can keep an eye on things, where you cannot uh, cheat on ratings, where you have to match maturities or else put up the appropriate capital against that. And where, uh, particularly with it, when it comes to smaller and less liquid credit lending or you know, long-dated credit lending, that it's treated the way it is. In other words, the amount of uh, risk that is perceived by investors has to match the actual underlying risk. So, thanks, Dr. Karthik, uh, please you. I have five questions for you. <laughs> Sorry, and I don't want to put it in a uh, box like that. But yeah, uh, what and how you be in the midst of uh, uh, watching, having to act, react, reconfigure, rebalance, whatever works, re engineer the entire rating methodology. Tell us how did the experience of the rating is you was during the last 15 months? No, no. Uh the last 40-50 months have been quite challenging for, for not only for rating agencies but almost all constituents of the economy and most specifically on the financial sector. From our point of view or in general from a rating agency point of view, you know, the, the core is how to analyze a credit. Fundamentally if you look at it, nothing has really changed in the way we analyze the credit. Any developments, any further, uh, you know, 
improvements on that is always a continuous process which one does at every point in time. This exercise has obviously, or this event, has obviously given us some more insights to, to look into a few more aspects, which is what uh, we've been doing over the last couple of quarters. And uh, some of the important ones that we've been focusing as part of our analysis has been uh, a bit closer look on the liquidity position of the company. You know, if I was to just give a little bit of history from the Indian context, strong entities or in fact even an average credit quality uh, category entities, we really don't believe in keeping too much on balance sheet liquidity. The assumption or the history suggests money is always available, there's never a problem. We've had problems in the past, few weeks, 2000, maybe a month, 2008, little bit in 2013-14, that's about it. So for most of the companies, you would see an on balance sheet liquidity of probably a percent or two. I'm talking from the BFSI space, more specifically, let's say NBFC, HFC. What has happened now? That quantum has increased to five, six percent on an average for on the balance sheet of entities. For some entities, that has even gone up as high as 15 to 20 percent. But that's definitely a change. The other key learning that one has uh, sort of learned is how do you evaluate or look at liquidity. Sachin said, you know, there's three months of liquidity, also taking into account undrawn bank lines. In the current context, that itself becomes questionable. Which is the bank that is giving you, has sanctioned? Will that bank be in a position to give you funds or no? What happens to, to your own credit profile in case there is a funding squeeze for, for let's say two months or three months? And the funny part is, when we interact with banks, the banks say, why are you even factoring in my sanction and drawn lines? You should not be looking at that. <laughs> so That's from, a revolution. <laughs> so from a rating agency side, you know, we, we do tend to believe that if sir, sanction is, is available, you will be able to draw. But of course, given the uh, investor lender anxiety, risk averseness, things are, are definitely evolving at this point in time. So that's something that we've been looking a bit more closely. The other thing is also in terms of lender profile for most of the entities in the BFSI space. Lakshmi just said that investors, lenders are differentiating between entities. So we also have started looking at a couple of aspects, which are the lenders, and again, all said and done from an Indian context, banks is one homogeneous set of investors, stock lenders, mutual funds, insurance, rest possibly not really accessible for most of the other market participants. So any excess dependence on, on one category, we, we are a bit more cautious on those entities. Even if it is a banking sector, which is 60 to 70% of uh, the providers of liability for any institution, you know, a little bit of diversification on that side. The third thing which uh, the regulator has been asking us to do and uh, while we were doing it in bits and pieces in the past, we put across a structure around that which is take into account or at least look at, at market feedback. What I mean by market feedback is secondary market trading rates or primary issuance rates. I agree that the markets are not deep enough, they are you know, where deviations, it, it may, may not give the, the right answer. And this is again with the assumption that the market's always right, which again may not be the case. But the thing is, one is now consciously trying to look at some of these other aspects as well, and then form a, hopefully a, a better opinion on, on the same thing. That apart, given uh, that the stress is largely on on the institutions which have funded a certain category of assets. So undoubtedly the, the focus, extra energy is spent on, on analyzing the asset side of, of those institutions. So by and large these have been the broad level changes as far as uh, evaluating and assessing entities have been uh, sort of evolved as a, a fallout of uh, the, the events that have built in the last 12-15 months. I think back to you. Oh, sorry, Sachin. Okay. 
I just wanted to uh, put across in terms of what Karthik mentioned on in terms of you know the three or uh, three months or four months that you know uh, sanctions are available. For the, uh, I mean, it's perfectly valid uh, in terms of you know uh, the observation. But for a retail NBFC, you know, as I was mentioning, where you have a situation uh, where your you know retailers are and you know you have that uh, ALM comfort coming in, all that it results in is that if the bank sanctions don't come in, you don't you know do such disbursements. Or to that extent, your disbursement scaling down will happen. It's nothing more than that. Uh, I mean, that topic, uh, while we heard from Sachin that uh, you know the shape of the balance sheet or the capital structure in his balance sheet with liquidity needs and all is supposedly reflected of a similar nature retail uh, led NUFCs. But if you were to reflect upon current state of uh, structure of a balance sheet of a corporate lending industry, what would you say? How much of change has been visible? How much more has to be done? Where do we see investors building that confidence into? The I think on, on the wholesale lending institutions is going to take some more time. Uh, maybe Lakshmi could just build on it because the way we are seeing it is there is a complete uh, risk averseness. In an Indian context, one uh, when we say wholesale institutions, there are only very broadly put two categories of, of investors. One, let's say the, the government or infrastructure related or the IFCs, some of them are private. The second is real estate focused entities. We don't really have anybody of a standalone corporate banking NBFC kind of a thing. There are players, there are groups who, who do part of their portfolio on, on these segments as well. But the, the focus is clearly uh, shining on negatively, of course, on, on entities uh, which have some part, if not more, on, on the real estate segment. And then Given the developments, given the, the discoversness, obviously uh, nobody wants to touch those entities even with a barge phone, which clearly reflects on, on the spreads as well. While I again put across the disclaimer that you know the, the risk averseness has really caused the spreads to widen, but very simplistically if you want to just look at it today, let me just take commercial paper as a benchmark, you know, not the right example, but just for uh, putting things in context. Today you have some entities raising a 30 day, 60 day, 90 day CP at what, 5.5 at an A1 plus rating and you have another set of A1 plus rated entities doing a similar tenor at 9, 9.5, 10. Which are kind of wholesale? Kind of them on the wholesale. Under the wholesale lending not them on the wholesale lending. Not them on the wholesale fund. We've never seen this kind of a tenor. 400 basis point, 300 basis point. In the past. So a lot of, yeah. And a lot of these entities are obviously scaling down uh, on their operations building up on balance sheet liquidity. The, the focus has clearly moved away from growing, but more to, to collecting and paying down their balance sheet and ensuring that they they have liquidity for, for a few more months than what they would have ideally wanted as part of an overall broad uh, corporate policy. Lakshmi, uh, uh, changing track towards uh, great spreads. So one of the reflection, the reflection of the market is also reflected into uh, what a uh, tenor money is visible, available, what tenor money uh, bonds or what tenor bonds are getting big offer in a second week and all of that finally passes into some kind of a price spread game. If I recollect uh, 2017 and 2017, uh, 2017 which is almost two years back, there was a lot of uh, ups and downs because probably led to the market quality on the rates front and this should pass into illiquidity in the corporate bond side and the spreads were looking wider. Then uh, April 2018 to May, June, July 18, there was a good time probably after the in the new, of an, uh, new financial year, but then has happened and the spreads moved out. Reflecting all of that, so what can we make out of the credit spreads today for a double A corporate five year? Is there a double spread there? A triple A corporate, triple A PSO, triple A NBFC, double A NBFC. Sorry, I've given up. If you can just reflect. Yeah, I, will, I will simplify it. Uh, for the benefit of the audience uh, who might not be uh, subject to such torture of tracking uh, all these. But uh, has anybody seen this movie uh, Vala? It's a Bollywood movie and the, uh, the actor is, uh, sorry not Ajdi Khan, it's Aishman Khurana, uh, lesser known actor but this guy in the movie is ha has this problem of balls and he has a receding hairline. As a kid he used to make fun of people. But as he grew up, he realized that he was getting uh, 
younger but obviously older because of his uh, receding hairline and finally he is bald. So this guy actually uh, finds a friend in the form of a wig and when the wig is there he is behaving like all of you sitting in this room having loads of hair and uh, yeah all of us in this panel also. And, um, so the NBFCs or the PSUs and the spreads as Karthik rightly says, the A1 plus, okay, all the A1 pluses were this bala with the wig. So how do you know who is bald and who is not? And then suddenly IFS happened. Suddenly something happened in that movie. If you see the movie, I won't spill the beans. Please contribute to GDP of Bollywood. What happened is that IFS happened and this wig got blown off. And then you realize that he is bald. So now that baldness is commanding a very different premium. And today if you see that uh, people have realized that this baldness was uh, concealed from us by whoever, you can say it is concealed by me myself as an investor or by the promoter or by the rating agency or whoever. So today the extent so much that people are thinking he doesn't have hair at all, just not hair on his head. So that is the kind of distinction people have made and the spreads have gone to some absolutely unacceptable levels. And continue to remain like that and for a long time. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yes. The longest period that we have seen that spreads have been so elevated. Absolutely. Maybe uh, when he wore the wig, he should have worn wig suiting his age, you know, maybe a little bit of salt and pepper and stuff like that rather than having a jet black wig. Because now markets have moved into extremes and something which is so there are three types of credit in the market. There is a good, there is a bad. Third is not ugly. Third is not so good. So this not so good category is trying to prove itself good, good, good. But investors, few of them are saying, no, you are closer to bad, bad, bad. And the difference between the good and the not so good itself is as high as 3%. And do I need to tell you the spread between the good and the bad? Will there be an ugly though we don't touch? You know, we are very uh, dhuta So that is the kind of... Uh, uh, spread differentials and to give you some numbers, this is theory, but just to give you some numbers, if the best in line uh, without big head person is borrowing at say 5% or 5 quarter for very short term, the uh, balas of the world are borrowing at maybe 10%, 5% higher or maybe 4.75% higher and that too very selective lending happening. Okay? And the beach wala who are trying desperately to grow their hair are borrowing at least 2% higher. So it is 5 by quarter, maybe 7.5-8% uh, and, and then this whole world of 10-12%. to 12 And when I flip this equation to slightly longer maturity, say 3 years, the western line breed is borrowing at say ballparkish 7% which is the uh, uh, legitimate father mother which is the government of India borrowing at fantastic levels okay and people want to give more and more and more so industry is categorizing them between the haves and the have nots and the have nots the poor guy who don't have money don't have hair nothing are actually borrowing at 12 13 percent now I find this completely ridiculous completely dichotomous I and mean, then how much of premium you will give to somebody with hair I don't understand here yeah? after marriage anyway you lose hair and then what happens after that? Do you then uh, divorce yourself from the credit? The answer is no. So I think that sanity has to come somewhere. It has to st start percolating. And that is the reason we remain constructive about credit funds. Uh, I know it sounds like a repeat of what Santosh said, but don't worry, we didn't discuss this and he's not even here. But the fact remains that uh, that, that space looks extremely attractive, like the way we are bullish in terms of valuations in mid-cap space. We believe this spread has to be revert at some point in time. But that some point in time may probably happen uh, at the time when Rajin retires, which is not likely to happen anytime soon. Yeah, Dr. Rajan, you would like to share experiences? Well, I needed to. Oh, I need to. The you know, the baldness. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm kidding. Uh, I was, uh, this time I thought of a couple of metaphors, you know, because it feels like you've got a monopoly on the metaphors, right? So, uh, we call this phenomenon throwing the baby out with the bathwater, and it is actually extremely common. So, throughout, especially in less liquid markets and nascent markets, you get the most incredible blowouts. The thing I wanted to point out, and I think you've alluded to this, is that this is as much an opportunity as it is a crazy uh, kind of bad situation. So, and historically, you know, you need two qualities in order to take advantage of something like this. And number one, 
you do need a long horizon. Not necessarily that um, you have to hold it to that horizon, but you need the ability, if you need to, to sit through this. And you may even need to provide additional liquidity in the future. Because markets can remain illiquid sometimes longer than you can remain solvent. And so when you're in the credit game, it's really important to not overextend yourself and get too greedy. But um, often you get the opportunity of a lifetime. And if you look at enough credit markets, these opportunities of a lifetime come along every three or four years. Now, they don't come along in the same country every three or four years. but uh, I personally have seen at least 15 or 20 of these episodes. Now, the second thing though that you need is the hard part, the bottom up. You need to do the bottom up. So this is where, you know, the, the differentiation between the good, the not so good, and the bad and the ugly uh, may not always be correctly reflected in the spreads. You know, this may be entirely a matter of perception. For example, every real estate fund is treated the same. Okay. This is not the way you want to invest. You, you need the ability to differentiate between the good and the bad real estate funds, the good and the bad um, other types of corporate funds and so on. Yeah, so in the bargain we did see uh, alternate pools of liquidity and may I call upon uh, Sachin or Lakshmi about what other alternate liquidity uh, pool that you kept into should there be or you've seen others stepping into. Yeah, so you know, uh, during this uh, time period, that is, you know, in the last 15 months, the way things spawn, spawned out, obviously what Lakshmi was saying is uh, quite valid, but what happened at the start was that, you know, the good, the not so good, bad, all got, you know, into one bucket called like as far as NBFCs and HFCs are right? concerned, so, and that, you know, kind of uh, this perception was like, you know, uh, very much, uh, uh, I mean, we, we could all feel it in the market. For just as an example, we had two of our bond uh, yearly resets coming in during that period in November and December. And obviously, from an investor perspective, given the risk perception for the entire industry, you know, it was taken into the it, it was taken into the max level, and which was not something which uh, you know was palatable to us. So we had you know uh, gone ahead and prepaid both those you know uh, in in a period of 15 days if I remember right we prepaid around 500 crores of uh, our lines which we could have held on to if you know at a higher rate but we didn't do that possibly we only both should do that in that period because you know uh, that was a period when everybody was struggling for liquidity but then that perception did you know uh, I mean in, in bits and uh, pieces it got you know all the NDFC you know participants did get hit because of that. Over a period, we are just you know right now seeing that you know uh, the confidence coming back and uh, the, the straight tracked approach that the industry had towards NBFCs, you know the retail, the wholesale, everybody was looked at from one perspective. Today we are seeing that differentiation coming in. We are seeing you know mutual funds interest coming back into one you know, three-year paper, five-year paper for you know NBFCs. Of course, uh, the yield levels between the AAA and the AA, which used to be at a certain point earlier, it is still not at that. The the, the you know uh, gap is pretty wide, but at least you know the, the confidence seems to be coming back. Within the interim, what we have seen is that yeah, the alternate pools of you know debt, as I told you in, 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 uh, earlier, that you know you had the uh, overseas route being explored, you had the public NCDs you know going you know uh, I mean uh, issues coming in. And obviously, you know, banks, you know, appetite towards uh, sell down or, you know, uh, direct assignment transactions went up tremendously. But in the process, what has happened is that, you know, in the past where, you know, NBFCs typically were in the range of around 15 to 20 percent of their book being, you know, off book kind of, you know, in terms of their uh, and overall liabilities today that, you know, percentage is going up. It's going up to 30, 35 percent. And, uh, you know, the ratios to that extent look skewed in the, you know, in, in, in the, uh, I mean, going going forward basis because 30, 35 percent of, if you take it off from the book and then look at the ratios on on book basis, you know, that, that, that will give us a good picture. So that's the kind of change which has happened because of this. Quick question, again, uh, probably the same thing. So he referred to what was the pool situation, pool sell down, and a lot of that happened. And the volume data, if one were to look up, the volume that uh, crossed last, uh, uh, kind of this calendar year and last calendar year, the volumes are way too high. And after many, many years, uh, portfolio situations or pool sell downs were happening for assets which are not classified or eligible under party sector lending. So that was one of the a large uh, 
liquid is generation uh, mechanism that NBC is going to do so I have a quick minute on uh, whatever you saw as what kind of pools will be uh, you know so acceptable to the uh, buyer community what, how much, how much do you see? I think from a pool sell down point of view whether direct assignment or PDC one uh, positive change that one has seen over the last couple of years is in the past most of the pools which were being bought out were only for PSL requirements. What we've been seeing over the last two years uh, has been, it's been a mixed pack. We have a fair bit of volumes on, on non-PSL as well, which is, which is definitely good from a broader economy and a structure point of view. This crisis has uh, led to a situation where banks have been more amenable to, to buying out pools rather than giving term loans or a direct exposure on the NBFCs. And given that they find themselves in a sweeter spot as compared to NBFCs having been on the other side for, for the last couple of years, so the pool filters have been becoming tighter and tighter over the last six, seven months. So yes, partly aided by uh, the, the government and the RBI, NBFCs are able to sell down. But if you were to just look at the, the filters which a lot of these entities or banks have been putting, you know, the eligible pool against which you can uh, raise funds is actually shrinking. So that's something one needs to, uh, to watch out for. At the same time, we've also seen, notwithstanding the crisis, couple of new developments which have happened on a limited scale, but new developments nevertheless, which is we've seen new structures, new transactions which have come to the market, whether it is perpetual securitization, whether it is CLOs, whether it is covered bonds, we've been fortunate enough to, to rate a couple of them. But yes, there have been a couple of transactions of these which have happened and uh, we believe it, it should continue in the future as well. As Sarkar said in the earlier uh, session, you know, uh, more products may not be of too much scale, but definitely it does bring onto the table a few more investors, different types of investors, in the long run, they should all help towards making the debt markets more vibrant, which is something which we really need as far as the country is concerned. Uh, question again. The latest uh, uh, was RBI, sorry, Government of India is uh, announcing the private, sorry, partial credit <coughs> guarantee at 10% for rated pools at triple D plus and higher, while the other uh, watermark was double and higher. Uh, such an input, uh, have you done anything under this construct? No, we have not, no, no, not yet done any you know, structure, I mean, deal under the structure, primarily because most of the assets that we generate are, you know, get categorized under the private sector lending, and therefore, no, there is no appetite on that side, which is any level. And obviously, this partial credit guarantee comes at an additional cost. So, till the time, you know, we are not constrained on the side of, you know, appetite not being there for our, you know, asset uh, papers. You know, we, I, uh, and, you know, we don't see the need right now to get into it. Of course, you know, there have been a uh, few transactions. Today itself we got reported that few transactions have happened on that side. Uh, and uh, possibly other asset categories maybe, which are not getting categorized as uh, private sector lending. But I, the general feel is that PSL, you know, there is enough appetite out there and therefore there's no need to take this additional cost on it. Karthik, quickly, would some of this happen? Would it help the ratings uh, of the pool? Would the rating, the pool level rating go up? Thanks for this government. Uh, yeah. Pool level, there's nothing to got to do with the pool level uh, rating. Mind you, most of the, the way these transactions are being done is direct assignment with with some credit enhancement. Earlier, the, the minimum target was double A, now it is triple B plus. So, from that sense, from a structure point of view, from a policy point of view, one is trying to provide liquidity to, uh, to the NBFCs, HFCs. What we understand, we ourselves, we've rated a couple of transactions, so a lot of sanctions have definitely happened. I would not offhand have what's the quantum of sanctions that the banks have done. But as far as disbursement is concerned, it's still a mixed bag. Because, because the, the guarantee structure, the documentation, I guess it is the nodal agency to, uh, to sort of conduct the, the entire thing. There are still, uh, it's still WIP in that sense. Some transactions have happened, but a lot of disbursements are, are yet to happen under the same. A couple of contractory uh, regulatory changes or framework has happened which I would like uh, Lakshmi if you were to at uh, the regulator of which mutual funds regulator reduced the exposure, uh, brought the exposure numbers down to the sector. 
on the other side RBI uh, increased the exposure per obliger. Uh, how do you see such conflict contracting or uh, regulatory responses? No, I don't think firstly it is uh, conflicting. Uh, any, uh, I don't think any one of us have a choice to choose our mother or father and uh, regulator is one such entity and uh, always the mother and father is wrong. At some point in life, uh, the child always feels that the mother and father is wrong. But then in hindsight, when experiences happen and they realize that no, uh, they are always right. So I think that is regulator. Regulator is always right. So let's accept that firstly. Second is that, what is this era that we are living in? We are living in this era of Goldman, right? So 1979, Dishitesh Mukherjee, Modi, Amal Palekar. Not see it, please go and see it. All the Hollywood fans here, uh, Amal Palekar Modi, but it didn't stop over there. We had Rohit Shetty create a series of Goldmals. Right from 2006, uh, which was Goldmal, uh, then you had uh, Goldmal Returns, then you had a Goldmal Part 3, and then right now you have Goldmal again. So it's just not stopping, and then you ask him, will you do another sequel? And he said, yes, I might contemplate a Goldmal 5. So just imagine in that kind of a Goldmal scenario where uh, there are more and more uh, CDM promoters. Uh, have you heard of CDM promoters? Do you know the full form? No, please explain to the Okay, anybody knows CDM promoters? So when you have CDM promoters, what will the regulator do? So they will try to stifle creativity to some extent. And I think that is exactly what we are seeing right now because ultimately anything happens, okay? Anything happens, what happens? The complaint. The teacher will call the parent, okay? The pupil will call the parent, the maid will call the parent, the driver, everybody, whenever the child makes a mischief, the parent is called. So likewise, every investor has access to the regulator. And I think it is therefore a very onerous task at the hands of the regulator right now to ensure that they try to uh, squeeze the nuts and bolts. Uh, so it might sound stifling a little bit right now, but if you look at it from a slightly more long-term discipline perspective, so right from uh, one-year fixed deposits, one-year series in liquid funds, to having one month and beyond to be marked to market, I think we have seen there, been there and done it all. And trust me, it puts in a lot of discipline when you are managing such strategies because there is nothing called self-regulation. So when you actually are bound by a regulator, see Sita was bound by Lakshman Vekha, right, in Ramayan, but she decided to breach it. And when she decided to breach, we know history was made. So you don't have the luxury as an investor to breach the Lakshman Vekha. So some of them may probably uh, timing could be managed better. But I think these regulations are in the right spirit to ensure that it is always customer interest first and in this case it is the unit holder. Uh, there are dozens of questions on the on the app out here and uh, I have also a dozen questions left. But before I, I have two more formats to finish. One, uh, forward looking uh, using the revenue mirror, would credit derivatives helped us in our last year, two year, three year of uh, mitigating some of our credit accidents. Last thing you want to take care. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think offshore, the uh, CDS markets are fairly developed. We run offshore portfolios as well, uh, where we do have uh, uh, you know buying put options and writing put options as uh, facilities. Uh, and I think um, it shows off your conviction. Uh, so I think it would have been definitely better than what it is today. Uh, of course, liquidity, etc. Definitely, but having another. Uh, but a master when you are fighting the credit war definitely uh, would help along with Yeah. Yeah, so the CES markets, credit derivative swaps, are a bilateral contract between two parties that effectively play the same role as a corporate bond in terms of transferring credit risk between entities. The way that the CDS market has been built outside India um, has uh, has an interesting history, but it, it primarily was used at first to offset risk on banks' balance sheets. So when they had too much concentration risk in a single name, for example, they could use a CDS contract to offload some of that to a different entity. My suggestion here might be that uh, there are plenty of entities with concentrated risk, and the development of the CDS market in India might follow the same lines. You know, and take advantage of the need that exists. You need a, you, you require a 
systematic institutional need at least in one direction, you know, for a market to get started. Ideally, you want it in both directions. Cool. You want both people wanting the credit as well as people trying to get rid of the credit. When you have both, you get fair pricing. But when you have only a one-sided demand, for example, people need to offload a credit and there's no immediate offtake, that will trade at a cheap price. So someone will, uh, the price will cheapen until someone takes advantage of it. And I think the regulator is in the best position to judge just how much pressure to put on, for example, deconcentrating portfolios, etc., to get a market like that started. So that's actually only one out of many such derivative markets that can help both the credit and the interest rate markets here. The only issue from an Indian context is there's nobody on the other side. You know, <laughs> what, it, what it refers to then is it a subject matter from or a summit or a workshop. I, I, I think that the regulators can change that. Okay. With that, we will stop on that point. Um, I just want to ask the panelists to ask any questions. Do you have any other panelists before I, uh, you have some of the questions from the audience to, to shoot at you? Any one of you have any questions or other of your panelists? Oh, I wanted to keep the floor open for you to ask each other any questions before I make it open to the audience as well. Yeah, cutting from one body. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll uh, try and club some of those uh, questions. Uh, Sachin, Karthik, uh, any new ideas that may come to uh, market in terms of uh, structures that may be work in progress at the back you may want to reflect upon and share something may come up in next year or two? But any structuring ideas in, in the corporate markets, bond markets, CLO, can it become more prevalent? Some of these transactions which I just said, we have seen a couple of transactions once the uh, probably the readiness where appetite improves, we could probably see some more transactions coming up. As uh, Santosh and Lakshmi also said, credit funds, you know, it's not a bad word, it's, it's, it's an opportune time. So, uh, and liquidity is slowly but definitely coming back into the system. So we could see some more of these transactions come and possibly in, in turn also adapt the, the liquidity of, for the system. So I think there's an interesting uh, piece that one need to do uh, in uh, study that uh, private credit funds uh, participation in Indian corporate lending has increased manifold and there are a lot more uh, AIFs that are getting uh, worked upon or they have already raised uh, funds to lend for both uh, domestic sponsors as well as a whole host of uh, international sponsors. So that uh, private credit because of this location has become a fairly attractive proposition for many a career and uh, to you know, take advantage of credit distribution that we have seen now. Uh, Lakshmi, Lakshmi, what do you foresee a future six months, 12 months on rates on what will you advise any of the investors over here? I don't foresee, that's why I like lenses because it's difficult to see beyond. But actually what is happening is that a lot of conflicting signals are um, emanating uh, from a policy decision making perspective vis-a-vis -vis what is actually happening um, in reality. Uh, we saw the recent monetary policy committee decided uh, unanimously to vote for a status quo. Uh, it was a complete kahani mein twist kind of a scenario. Bond markets reacted. Uh, all in sum and substance is that if inflation um, comes down, which is what our base case assumption is, the key question we need to ask is are interest rates going up or are, are, are we likely to see a rate hike anytime soon? And right now I think I would bet that the answer is no. So if the answer is no and there is going to be sufficient liquidity which will not let yields go up um, and of course the future uh, scope for interest rates uh, to be accommodative remains open, we believe that a stable to benign interest rate scenario is likely to continue at least for the foreseeable future. I think uh, if there was a unwinding, drop unwinding or rewinding, how would you have expected a better handling of some of the things that went south, or the DHFL or ILFS? Was there some way to do better prediction? Uh, I think it would have been difficult in any issue. Yeah, given the next one you went for India. To an extent, yes, but uh, but yeah, in, in hindsight, one could have possibly, you know, now that a lot of 
other stuff has come out in public domain, maybe you could always say that you, know, you should have looked at a few more things a, a bit more closer. But, but yes, at the point it happened, it, it was definitely done. Anything else, uh, Sachin, you would have expected Red Little to do or you would expect, I mean, would have hoped Red Little does something that helps the ecosystem right now? No, I just wanted to uh, put a point when Lakshmi was mentioning the question that you said about you know, SETI taking a view of bringing it down the 25 to 20 as well as NDSH was a concern. You know, RBI feels that you know, we should be more under the capital market rather than depending on banks. Now, uh, here, you know, uh, if you look back in terms of, you know, post the CRD crisis in 97 and, you know, say, till 15 months earlier, you never had anything much in terms of uh, NDFC default or, you know, NDFC going down kind of a scenario happening. And in that context, if you look at today, you know, still, you know, of the entire credit, 15%, you know, it is what goes to NDFCs. And then you look at in the, the, you know, the, the risk which is associated with that in terms of stress account, and it will be hardly some 0.5% and that's also something which got built up over the last one year. Before that, hardly anything and in that point five also if one goes down and looks, you know, the, there's a bifurcation between retail and BFC then wholesale, you know, retail is hardly anything to speak about. So I can kind of, you uh, know, clearly feel that there should have been a differentiation which should have been brought in. And now it's almost 15 months and we have seen how both the segments have kind of, you know, survived through this period in terms of retail and wholesale. I clearly feel there was a case where you know, there should have been a differential kind of uh, treatment for the uh, much more sustainable retail franchises as compared to wholesale, you know, and this was a bit kind of, uh, uh, maybe, you know, uh, timing was, you know, it was a bit good having, uh, I mean, kind of deferred or not looked at at the present time. Thank you. Uh, friends, a long applause for our panelists here. They have shared a lot of uh, their experience, their learning, their opinions. Without being, uh, know, without being any uh, diplomatic about it, which is very frank, and thank you all, friends. And uh, over to Kumira to continue the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jain, uh, and all the panelists for a wonderful session. As uh, Jain alluded to, it was a panel of uh, Rajini Gans and, uh, if I may say, uh, Anandara. Uh, we had a you know very energetic uh, conversation post lunch. I was a uh, little worried if people may uh, doze off but the topic and the uh, weight of the discussion was uh, so good that we are uh, more awake now and uh, ready for more.